to the Redskin. Go Redskin! good people you know i had to come on the day and talk a little bit about this game against the atlanta falcons this was a horrendous matchup uh, for the washington redskins Look, first of all let me let me go ahead and say congratulations to the atlanta falcons fans that, that i know on here and anybody that might run across this video um and a special shout out to uh david in atlanta and uh ar sergeant 10 and augusta gator I know I know a ton of other Falcon fans on here, but I want to give those guys a shout out because they made it a point to either make videos or comment my video and shout out to those guys. You know, Atlanta played an unbelievable game. There's some things that I want to talk about that happened with the game and the Redskins. So, uh, you know, if, if, if you're just here to hear me say congrats, then there you go. Uh, but as far as the game goes, like I was saying just a second ago, Atlanta looked unbelievable in this game. And that had a lot to do with several different reasons. One of which is they're playing at the top of their game. You know, they're getting, I think they're getting some injured players back and they're starting to click. And I mean, they got weapons out the ass. Now, that being said, Looking at things from the Redskins' perspective, you know, the, the number one thing that led to Washington losing this game, without a doubt, was the third down percentage of Atlanta and, uh, and our defense not being able to stop them. I mean, just any time that you allow a team to go 8-for-8 eight eight in the first half on third downs and 10-of-13 for the entire game, you're probably going to give up more than 38 points. Let's just be honest. The inability of, uh, of the team to get off the field is really what led to Washington giving up damn near 40 points. And to me, I don't know where that starts and begins at, but it has a lot to do with the team not playing at the top level like they should. I also believe this just in the back of my head something's telling me that the Clinton Dicks hitting the field the very first week, maybe not just a few days after joining the team, probably messed the chemistry up a little bit. I was hoping that they would work him in and get him used to the system. Because you know, a lot of times when you got like Nicholson was playing with, with Swearinger, maybe they had gotten, you know, kind of used to playing with each other. You mix another guy in the mix and things change. I heard him say today that there were some problems with communication on the field, uh, some, some, some problems with crowd noise during the plays and getting the shit called out for him to be able to understand where he's going to go. But these guys are professionals. They're supposed to be able to see through a lot of this. I think it has more to do with he's not used to the defense as much as they had hoped, or he hasn't acclimated that quickly enough to be able to start last week. But anyway, you know, the, the second thing that pops out is the injuries. You know, I'm never one to claim any kind of injury excuse, and I'm not gonna start here. But I will have to point out that I believe on our second offensive series, Sean Laval backpedaled twice and fell down and blew his knee out. He's his career is probably over as a Washington Redskin now. I'm actually surprised they brought him back this year. It was only on a one year deal and it was a much lowered contract. Now, what that injury does in the long term is points out that our depth was really thin at that position. Maybe that has a lot to do with the NFL and the way that contracts are structured now and the way that the, the talent at, on the offensive line is really thin. Or maybe it has to do with Washington just not being good at you know, putting depth together, especially not at the left guard position. Whatever it has to do with. It ended up with, you know, us having to go a couple of different ways. I believe once uh, Laval went down, we had to put, what was his name, Bergstrom in there. Uh, 
and then once I think that worked out a little bit but once you know they had to shift again you know it just things didn't work out after Brandon Sheriff went the sheriff went down you know they had to shift again and figure out how they were going to work that and you ended up with Ty and Seki at left at left guard and Chris, Christian at left tackle it just wasn't a pretty sight and, and I don't think Christian is ready for the NFL game just to be quite honest I'm not sure if it's because they haven't brought him along well enough or if it's just because you know he's just not good enough at this point in his career but whatever it is that he got pushed over quite a few times in the game and it was obvious that you know, the Redskins need needed something else there, but obviously it's because Trent Williams was out for the game. And he probably will miss at least another week, which means heading into Tampa, they're going to be without their left tackle, their left guard, their right guard, two of the top three wide receivers, and the third down back. More than likely, because Chris Thompson will probably miss again. I mean, that's a potential. But, you know, they just announced today... The, the Sheriff, Laval, and Paul Richardson are all out for the year. They're all on injured reserve now, which is a big hit. Um, you know, that's that's a big hit. So now at the, at the wide receiver spot, you'll see Maurice Harris probably get more of a role, which I've been screaming forever. He's actually come on hard. I think he might actually challenge Doxson for it's over with for the one. And you know, I can't. I was gonna get. I was gonna kind of. I was really just all set to go off on Doxson at first, you know, because he dropped two passes early on. But Doxson actually redeemed himself as the game went on. I felt like the refs were kind of picking on him a little bit. I don't even want to say that. I hate even saying that, but because I know that the NFL has a problem with officiating across the board. But that play, when he caught the ball and he spun it which happens multiple times in, 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 in any game pretty much nowadays. He got a penalty for it, and it's just it's just odd to me. You know, it's odd to me. He got a penalty for taunting, for spinning the ball. And I've seen at least six or seven times a game the players spin the ball. I saw at least four or five times yesterday players spin the ball. The only one that got penalized was Doxon. That's odd to me, okay? You should, just odd to me you know I don't like to say certain things but if one guy gets penalized for it then the whole then there shouldn't everybody get penalized for it another thing I noticed with the referees was a it seems like a whole lot of times Atlanta wide receivers were running a lot of pick plays you know they, they run one they run their wide receiver to one side this way and another across this way and they would kind of run a little pick you know and it didn't get called over and over and over again and it, it was something that was like wow you know you, you could really point it out and see it and um you know but i also saw some penalties you know like especially the hit on sheriff and you know that was the play where he got called on a penalty because he got hit with a with a they called a hold a holding penalty on him and it negated the 25 yard run by ap now the reason why that sticks out in my brain before I rewatch the game is that Moses was hit with a 15 yard penalty right after that for telling the official he missed the low hit on Sheriff. Now, the hit on Sheriff ended up being the hit where he hit the ground and hurt his shoulder and it's, it's a season ending injury now. That's the reason why that sticks out in my brain. Now, as I said a minute ago, I'm not one to blame the officials because I know this is a league wide problem. But we've already had one game this year where officials were fired after it was determined they missed multiple calls, and that's the Saints game. I feel like we might be looking at a second one here, but that's neither here nor there. You know, the offense and the defense both still could have come out and played better than they did. It doesn't help the fact that, um, you know, it doesn't, excuse me, it doesn't change the fact that the Falcons still kicked our asses. It doesn't change the fact that on most plays the Falcons ran, they were getting positive 
you know, yardage, it doesn't change the fact that with on all the plays that the Falcons scored on, they ramrodded us in coverage. I mean, just blocks were just knocking our guys off. The holes were mile wide. I mean, you know, you, you could run my dead grandmother through them and she'd get it. She'd get a touchdown. I mean, it really was an embarrassing uh, show by our defense, especially after the way they played all year. So that's why I said there's multiple things that led to the way this all turned out. On defense, the defensive line really did not do their job yesterday whatsoever. And that's for multiple reasons also. Atlanta won a lot of their one-on-one matchups. When there's questionable calls, it throws a lot of salt in the game, man, and it makes a lot of things kind of iffy. You start questioning a lot of things. That's why I said I want to leave officiating out of it because it's a league-wide problem. Everybody is going through this officiating issue. You know, with the breakdown of the offensive line, there was absolutely no way that Gruden's offense of running AP over and over again was going to work. And, uh, to be honest with you, the Falcons did a good job of stopping AP as well. So, we were completely inept. Now, I did see that Alex Smith threw for 300 yards, whoop to do You know, I don't really care. In a losing effort, that's just patent stats. I've always said that. Now, I'm not going to say that he was necessarily completely padding stats, but in the end, that's what ends up happening. Now, moving forward, the offense needs to find a way to move the ball while being able to throw it and run it. So, you know, the amount of negative plays that happened in in that football game cannot continue to happen. Because if they do the outcome is going to be much the same every time. Now, Washington, in, on their schedule, the, you know, they play Tampa next, which I hope they don't take them for granted because Tampa's got a really good defensive line. And they could cause a lot of problems with the issues that Washington has for, on injuries on the offensive line. So, you know, it could get interesting real quick. Tampa is a team that we should beat. But that doesn't mean we will beat them with the injuries we have on the offensive line. They might take advantage of what's going on and just beat us to death. I know Gerald McCoy has got to be licking his chops right about now. Now, the injuries are, are, are knocking at our door trying to derail the season. Now, that is, I won't lie, a bit scary as far as things are concerned. When you lose, you already don't have Trent Williams. And then you lose both your starting guards. That's a bad sign. And I know the NFC East collectively right now is licking their chops. Even Bad Dog over there, who's going to say that he's not. Mr. Bad Dog 7676. You know he's going to sit over there and say he's not. Oh, no, the Giants are done. But he's licking his chops, too, because he's thinking, hmm, now we can get to his quarterback and knock him down a little bit, a little payback for that last game. He say what he wants to, but even he's thinking that right at this point. We did go out today. We signed Austin Howard. I believe he started like 88 games across the NFL, like Baltimore, Oakland, the Jets. Maybe even think he spent some time in Pittsburgh. He's like 6'7", 330. He was with the Ravens last year for 16 games he started. But, you know, I guess that it's a good chance that he starts at right guard. And they'll probably either keep Bergstrom at left guard and – Ty and Secchi at left tackle while Trent's recovering. Or they could move Bergstrom to center and put Rudier at left guard. I don't know. Just depends on what the coach thinks is the best combination. I mean, Morgan Moses had some issues too, man. Don't Nobody should, you know, miss the fact that Morgan also missed some time in this game. I mean, he's a warrior, man. Like, he, he, he gets hurt all the time, but he comes back. He hobbles. He's a big-ass man with some little-ass ankles. And he stays hurt on them things all the time. Um, but one of, the, one of the other things I need to point out is the fact that he was penalized four times yesterday for holding. And I believe it, it was either it was either one or I know it was I know it was at least one 
unsportsmanlike, but I might have been too. And um, the, the, the holding penalties generally scream, well, offensive linemen generally scream he's probably hurt or beaten by a faster guy. And everybody knows that he was matched up against Vic Beasley. And I saw multiple times where Beasley just blew past him and he had no choice but to hold him. So I kind of understand the holding call, so I'm not going to rub his face in it too much. But I heard that the injury he had was to his MCL on his knee, so hopefully he can get that right, but he's day-to-day. Quentin Dunbar left again with that same lower leg nerve issue. He's day-to-day. Jamison Crowder is still out. I'm starting to wonder if (laughs) if this season's going to ever continue because they're just going to put him on IR. Um, Richardson, first year with us, ends with, I think he ended with like, 20 catches or something. I'm, I'm gonna look. I actually have a list. Hold on. Yeah, Richardson's first season ended with seven games, 20 catches on 35 targets, 262 yards, and two touchdowns. I mean, that's not bad, but we were expecting a lot more. I mean, he got 20 catches on 35 targets. You can't get more, you know, when you don't get a chance. So I can't exactly get mad at him. And I've heard from the press and whatever the media to beat has all said that he's battled from injury all since offseason so if Washington just like I mean they got really desperate yesterday and they actually had to exercise the idea of who the uh, backup or I shouldn't say backup the emergency offensive lineman was going to be and it was that it was Matt Ioannidis and I'm wondering to myself, so Matt Ioannidis is going to start on defense and offense. We're going to have an Iron Man player. But they were, Gruden said today they were going to sign three or four guys. Austin Howard's the first one. And while I'm sitting here taping this, they liable to have signed a second one. Um, and he said one or two of them might start. I, I, don't, I don't really see the, the idea of, of another one starting over Bergstrom, but unless there's something wrong with Bergstrom that he didn't want to say, but I did hear him say that the Inseki was, was was a little dinged up too. I haven't seen the uh, an injury report yet. Uh, they don't normally put one out till Wednesday. I also haven't seen the quotes from a day yet, but they'll come out in a little while, and then I'll be able to tell more. But, you know, judging by what I saw on the field yesterday, Washington's got a lot of work to do, and it's obviously going to start with them having to take care of the things that broke down and didn't work in yesterday's game. Moving forward, it's going to be interesting to see how well the offensive line can come together. I, My expectations are kind of low, but we do have one of the better offensive line coaches in the, in the game, so... We'll have to give him a chance to see what he can put together because Bill Callahan is a mastermind when it comes to getting these guys to play right. I don't even know what to say about Josh Norman at this point. Like, he played really good the last two or three weeks, and then yesterday it just appeared like he hit you know, the brakes a little bit and didn't play well at all. But he's still Josh Norman. He's still out there making, you know, doing what he does. He was also following around the best receiver in all of football. How much can we really get down on him about that? You know, if you you follow the best receiver in football, you're going to get burned a couple times. And Julio let him know. That's about all I got, man. You know, I'm probably going to come on and do a video about the Tampa Bay game in a couple of days. All right, that's about all I got, man. Hell to the Redskins. Peace.